Good evening, listeners, brave navigators of the enigmatic and the concealed. Have you ever felt the pull of the unanswered, the allure of the mysteries that shroud our existence? For more than a decade, a unique comic publisher has dared to dive into these mysteries, unafraid of the secrets they might uncover. This audacious entity is Paranoid American. Welcome to the mystifying universe of the Paranoid American podcast. Launched in the year 2012, Paranoid American has been on a mission to decipher the encrypted secrets of our world. From the unnerving enigma of MK Ultra mind control to the clandestine assemblies of secret societies. From the awe-inspiring frontiers of forbidden technology to the arcane patterns of occult symbols in our very own pop culture. They have committed to unveiling the concealed realities that lie just beneath the surface. Join us as we navigate these intricate landscapes, decoding the hidden scripts of our society and challenging the accepted perceptions of reality. Folks, I've got a big problem on my hands. There's a company called Paranoid American making all these funny memes and comics. Now, I'm a fair guy. I believe in free speech uh, as long as it doesn't cross the line. And if these AI-generated memes dare to make fun of me, they're crossing the line. This is your expedition into the realm of the extraordinary, the secret, the shrouded. Come with us as we sift through the world's grand mysteries, question the standardized narratives, and brave the cryptic labyrinth of the concealed truth. So strap yourselves in, broaden your horizons, and steel yourselves for a voyage into the enigmatic heart of the paranoid American podcast, where each story, every image, every revelation brings us one step closer to the elusive truth. It is time to steal yourselves. I don't even actually know what that means. It just sounded really cool, but it's like a real word. Um, so today I've got one of my favorite people. People say that all the time, but I'm serious, like top three favorite people of all time. I think one of the first people that I was ever on a podcast with in my entire life, the one, the only, Cheney Wonderland. Welcome, welcome to the Paranoid American Podcast. It's been a long time coming. I've been I've been threatening you with uh, coming onto my own podcast for like years, I think. So it, it's finally here. We're here. It's finally here. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to be here. I'm proud of you that you're doing this finally because you're one of the best guests out there. So I can imagine your show is going to be fire. I, I appreciate you. And honestly, the, the show was mainly because there's so many tangents that I've gone on as a guest with like other guests on shows. And like, you know, it's not my show. Like I can't. OK, everyone stop the conversation. We're going to follow this, you know, this weird thread that no one else maybe cares about as much. Uh, like like a, a good one. I hate to bring this up as the first example, but like Flat Earth comes up. And like I've heard all of the different like flat earth theories, but I am absolutely obsessed with the concept of infinite land because I've seen the maps and everyone's like, oh, cool. There's Atlantis. There's Lemuria. There's, you know, Thor world or whatever. But my eye always goes to the, the four corners of the map because I want to like see, you know, what's at the edges of them because it's, you know, it's not just a cliff. You know, you don't you can't just fall off the edge. So then the argument is like. Well, there's a little corner that says the endless sands or like the endless ocean. And now I'm like, well, I'm more interested. Anyways, I I'm not going to get into that yet. We'll get into that a little bit later. But that's that was kind of the main reason was like, I want to chase all these weird little rabbit holes. And uh, and I feel like um, like we're kind of the, the same nature in that regard. In fact, we've probably talked more offline and like on non-recorded shows, just like, hey, I've got a crazy idea. Let's talk about this for a few hours. So like you're you're my refuge back into I don't want to say like a sanity check it's almost like the opposite of that you know what I mean the opposite I know because what's called sane is you know oh, almost insane like it's all the wrong stuff like all the stuff we're educated with but um, you do the same for me like it's a balance but it's almost like in your voice is definitely inside my head it's like a balanced contrarian <laughs> that's that that's the uh cia nlp training that's the, that's the freemasonry <laughs> they teach us that day one it's actually really simple like i can't tell you i'm sorry that's just know. level one free yeah, just level one. <laughs> yeah. we get we get over nine thousand at a certain point so, <laughs> so i mean speaking of like i guess 
the I don't have a better name for the in, insanity check because it's not quite that. But here's a good example that maybe we can kick off with. Like the the Britney Spears thing has been up and down for years, right? Like like they finally let her out. She they let it. They took off the MK Ultra collar. Maybe I don't know if you can actually ever take that off. It's just probably on forever. <laughs> but uh, it's like there's so many crazy hot takes on she's a clone she's programmed it's you know she's not even real it's just ai at this point um so many so so many and that's one where it's like i know that the topic itself is crazy like you can't bring it up and then expect a fully rational conversation at the end but you can have it with someone that you think is rational so you are lucky you you're one of those people <laughs> that i feel like has heard a bunch of the different theories and has maybe even like chased them down more than me. Like you've done more of the legwork than I have. So I'm curious, like what, like what's your ultimate take? Even if you don't have to stand by it tomorrow, okay. like what, what's your current take at this moment? I think people that think it's silly, like Britney Spears is a silly conspiracy, mm. but then they would look into 9-11. I would say those same people would say, follow the money. And I would argue that Britney Spears is worth way more than the Twin Towers ever were. And the same could be said about a Michael Jackson. The same could be said about a Whitney Houston, maybe even more so a Dolly Parton, because the writer of the song is always more uh, wealthy in the long haul, the controller of the musing, so to speak, the controller of the muse. Um, but Britney, I think she is similar to every conspiracy. It starts out that even what the media tells you is fishy. You're like, okay, this girl, she was just on the Mickey Mouse Club. She dated Justin Timberlake. She had an affair with Wade Robinson. She uh, got married to some white trash guy and had two kids. You know, she did some drugs, shaved her head. Uh, obviously went a little crazy. Her parents take control of her money, but then they continue to make her perform in Vegas. Uh, and now she's quote unquote free of her conservatorship and she's putting crazy videos in a house over and over again that she said she sold when she had a baby last year that she said she miscarried. But we're seeing this person that looks nothing like the Britney Spears and sometimes she has a gap and sometimes she doesn't have a gap. And sometimes she looks like she's in a shoddy hotel room and sometimes she looks like she's in a mansion. And then we find out her husband right now who she's getting a divorce from now, um, but she had a wedding that there's no paparazzi of her anywhere, anywhere, not a New York restaurant, not anywhere we see photos of her that she says she's in Mexico or photos of her that she's like, Hey guys, I just got a new tattoo. And like she does, you know, has weird <laughs> voices cause she's never talking about her herself, but her man owns a CGI company. And, um, I think it's interesting because every president has a blonde. I think you can go throughout time and every time a president is about to get a little bit of media attention or they're, it's not going the way it should for them, they have their blonde to step in and kind of take all of the attention off of them. And I think Britney is, has always been Bush Jr.'s blonde. And so it's just interesting to me. I'm like, what's going on in politics that Britney here, we think Instagram and Facebook and YouTube, these are all free of MK Ultra. These are all free of mind control. I'm picking this entertainment for myself. Like, nope. What's the character of Britney Spears on Instagram? What is this? To what end? To what? We're all watching her just turn in circles every day. It's so wild. It's fascinating. It it's is fascinating. Fascinating. So... I've heard that she's on had been given too much lithium. I've heard she was an alcoholic. Like these are all simple things, but things she has said is uh, they've taken so much blood from me. They've taken so many vials of blood. Like they'll take 30 vials of blood from me in a week. Even if you were testing somebody for drugs, there isn't any conceptual reason that you would take 30 vials of blood from them in a week. And she said this in a bunch of interviews, like crazy amounts of blood. And uh, 
she seems like a crazy person. Like what I know about MK Ultra and kitten programming and Monarch, she seems like all those things. We can find pictures of her with Rachel Chandler. We can find pictures of her with Paris Hilton, which I would say Paris Hilton's just like a Rachel Chandler. Um, I think why would you get a whore from the streets of Vegas if you're a chic when you can buy Britney Spears? But if you want to get more nefarious, why would you get the adrenochrome from a schizophrenic just in some random hospital, USA, when you could have the adrenochrome of Britney Spears in these moments that they're showing us on Instagram are her cataloging the blood we can buy when? Oh, I love that. And so when that. she always deletes posts, <laughs> she puts them up and deletes them. Sold so out. So I think when the delete sold out. <laughs> Oh, that I could love like a chic is just watching the Instagram and it's like, oh, she's doing the cartwheels again. Quick, get the money. Get my credit card. I think this <laughs> is how all the famous people order their high level drugs. I think Howard Stern would order his adrenochrome by going on air. Welcome to the Howard Stern show, blah, 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 blah. Hey, Robin, how'd your weekend go? Oh, it was good, Howard. It was good. Oh, you want to know what I did? I had chicken Parmesan last night. Oh, did you, Howard? Yeah, I had chicken Parmesan and I get it and I put half the pasta in the trash right away, Robin. Oh, Howard, we know how you eat your uh, chicken Parmesan. We don't need to hear this again. Let me tell you, I have to tell you in detail. And then I peel all the skin off my Parmesan chicken. And then, you know, Howard, you can order that chicken without the skin already. Yeah, I like to do it this way, Robin. I peel all the skin off my chicken and then I eat it. That's him letting his dealer know he needs a re-up. <laughs> I mean, and this is established from like Mockingbird that we're not just making this stuff. This is how you would, I guess, send communication throughout. Now, it, it, it's less effective once people are in on it, although there's also... I think we've talked about this before. There's this idea of doing it out in the open. Some people think that it's like them rubbing your nose in it, you know, like your dog poops inside and it's like, you're going to just show them like, you know, smell this or whatever. <laughs> um, but, but there's also a concept that if you do it out in the open, then it alleviates some of the, the karmic action where like, if I tell you I'm about to rub your nose in it, uh, and then I do it, then I'm not the bad guy anymore because I kind of let you know what the rules and what the sequence of events were going to be. Um, so I'm just, I'm curious if you think that... Like revelation of the method a little. Right, yeah. And I'm, and I'm curious if you think that it's because, like, people notice it. Is it because they get sloppy? Do they do it on purpose? Like, uh, you know, is this the criminal that wants to get caught by the detective? Or is there something it, else to it? I don't think we were ever supposed to know the codes. I don't think we were ever supposed to know what walnut sauce meant. I don't think we were ever supposed to know what pizza code or handkerchief codes or hot dogs or ice cream. I don't I don't think we were ever supposed to know what all the emojis meant and how, you know, those are all ancient uh, for them. Like there isn't an emoji that we play with that isn't somehow symbolic for them. It's not for us ever. That's why we get a squirt gun and not a real gun. Like anymore, yeah, they phased it out. It was yeah, there for a little while, was, right? We had it. We lost our Second Amendment uh, emoji, right? <laughs> that's so, that's, that's so how I'm not sad. going to the metaverse. I already know. <laughs> <laughs> I already know what's going on there. What about like uh, like and spirit ladies cooking. don't squirt, so it's just. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. They do. They totally do. <laughs> it's just pee. It's just lizard pee. people. It's not what? pee. <laughs> <laughs> That's another conspiracy. No. Well, I'm here to tell you as the first lesbian on your show. <laughs> okay. Go I don't. Ahead. I don't see color, gender, anything, <laughs> race. Like I don't. I just keep my eyes closed and I don't have to. But what about like the spirit cooking aspect? Like that's obviously something that's done to show and they parade it around and, you know, you got politicians and celebrities hanging out and doing like the, the Salvador Dali style Rothschild surreal ball where they, here's a, a you know, a cake shaped like a baby and we're going to cut it open. And is this just them being edgy? Is this an actual magical ritual? And if so, like why being done out in the open with, PR and Getty, you know, Getty images to follow up and post them all online the day after. Or is it just like if you've already Jimmy Savile 
and you're royalty and you've Kevin Spacey'd and you Ghislaine'd and you Jeffrey Epstein'd and you Zorro Ranched and you uh, Les Wexner and you've hung out with N Peter Nygaard and you've hung out with, do, are you really think you ever are gonna get caught? Like, isn't it almost like brazen and the people maybe that we would think, oh my gosh, Charlie Sheen has lost his mind. But for them, they're like, when Charlie Sheen goes to one of the deep underground parties, he's seen as like the king. Or it's like everybody's railed Barack Obama. <laughs> <laughs> like it's not a big deal to the elite. Like I just... Sometimes I feel like we have to undo <laughs> our brain of what really goes on. Because people think this stuff is absurd. And I always call it, I hashtag it the Church of Hollywood every time I put, put it on anything on Instagram. Because the levels of this stuff and how far you can look back into Babylon of Hollywood. If you think Area 51 is where you should be looking, I would argue that you should be looking behind underneath the mountains. If you think Vegas is where you should look, I would argue that you should look underneath. If you think Hollywood is where you should look, I would tell you what's going on inside them hills. So we know that they've faked like how much stuff they mentioned. Like there's like space may be the final frontier, but it's made in a Hollywood basement. They could be talking about drugs or they could be talking about actual space. Probably are, you know? So it's... Uh, when you look up like uh, Jared Leto bought the house that was a CIA house and then you look at Jared Leto and he's all into these certain cults that a lot of these other celebrities grew up in the same cult of. And then you look at the serial killers and how Charles Manson attaches to Hollywood and all that. I'm like, people are naive to not think that the things that they sell their soul for of this fame and right in front of our face and this brazenness, this is what in like a simple term, like a demon or a dark entity would do. Like anything that you've read about, it's r real. I think the thing of Hollywood is to make us think all the fiction is silly kid stuff. And that's the stuff they're up to. Why we think we're all over here studying. I'm going to get smarter at medical and computers and I'm going to make a million dollars a year more than my counterpart. All your medical you went to school for is fucking fake. If like everything that we just witnessed over the past three years isn't the thing to show you that. And they'll be like, well, Western medicine, setting a bone isn't Western medicine. Like everything that people argue, like there's been some advances. Nope. All that stuff you can find in the oldest things. All the real quote unquote advances seem like they're taking years away from our life. Well, changing the average age of people back when is nope. That's because of SIDS. And I would argue that's probably vaccine related. <laughs> well, and also world wars. A lot of the time when they bring that up or they'll, you know, th they'll say something oh, back in the, the ancient times or in like the medieval ages. Yeah. But, but if you, remove the concept of you know like early death like basically just like um the infancy mortality yeah. rate but then if you also ignore the black plague and then you ignore like the civil war all of a sudden you know it, it is comparable they were living just as long as we are and i think that there's there's something this is a wild one there's a new show out i think it's called the blue zones it definitely has some crazy like uh new world order vibes to it but this you know, rich academic white guy discovers like three or four places on the planet where people have just always lived well into their late nineties hundreds without any, like without actually wanting to do it. Like it just naturally happens at a much higher rate, like eight times the rate of any other country. So he goes there and he, he like discovers, you know, what are making these people do it? But again, it's, it's just more example because these are in the middle of like Rockefeller center where the, the guy's got like, you know, one of everything he's had every operation, every surgery, every yeah. prescription ever given to him. There's just like people that just happen to have slightly less complicated lives. You know what I mean? Um, but so do you think that there's anything good about the Rockefeller medicine industry of any kind? Because I'll I'll give you uh, an easy uh -huh. one, and I guess this isn't a trick question, yeah, but the no, one no, that no, I really yeah, the the one that gets cited the most is that the the Rockefellers also brought along this this concept of having to be like a registered nurse or get like a degree or a diploma, like that Prussian system. They applied that to the medical industry, and before that, you could just kind of be a doctor and not have any sort of standard 
education where you could go to like another town then yeah. converse with that doctor using the same language so they they yeah, like to take credit for some of that aspect i think that would be a really awful thing because the second you put all those restrictions and guidelines on it we don't use any herbs anymore and look at how much stuff they fast track that they don't even go to school to learn so it's like the quote unquote FDA or CDC or whatever fast tracks, whatever they stick into our body, but no doctor gets educated on that. And since they started doing that, it, I think it was their plan all along the same way they did our educational system they've done to medicine. So now you have a specialty doctor for your left pinky finger, a different doctor for your eye, a whole different <laughs> practice of medicine for your teeth, a whole different practice of medicine for the, you know, it's like they have you and this doctor makes money for referring to this doctor and that doctor makes money off referring to that machine and this mach doctor makes money off referring to that, uh, you know, <laughs> a pharmaceutical patient and that money for insurance and this for that. And they're so they're all making money in between. People are getting, the insurance companies are getting raped over the coals. Um, they're charging you like $11 for an aspirin. And then you could probably even go uh, That would be to... cheap. That would be a cheap aspirin. <laughs> I know. We're talking then, about like a the hospital. aspirin yeah. is probably bare. And then you could go into the whole family that, oh, I'm sure Bear and the Rockefeller or Rothschild shook hands somewhere. And they were like, let's put this symbology all over everything. So, yeah, I don't know. Well, Bear know. was a German. That, that was, a, I believe it started in, you know, ger bad Germany and, and sort of moved yeah. its way over. Well, I guess more accurately, we've gotten into this before, but it kind of started in America-ish. It started in, like in Europe and then it went to America and then we were like, hey, let's throw some wheels on. Let's throw some money at this thing. And then Germany was like, okay, you got it, you know, on its wheels. We're going to go ahead and industrialize that. And then we were like, whoa, you guys were really good at that, but we're going to go ahead and take that back and... We're going to, you know, make, make it a little bit more subtle uh, as we continue on this. But yeah, I'm pretty sure Bear was involved right in the middle of that. They were, they were like probably... the pharmaceutical Fanta. There, it's like all those things come out now. It's like talcum powder is causing this. Oh, you mean this thing that everyone put on their child forever? Oh, well, Johnson & Johnson, do some research in that family. Oh, but the, it's not just your medicine, it's your chocolate. Research Hershey. You know, it's like all these people are the same. And Hollywood was over there selling you the script so you'd never question it. So it doesn't matter whether your buildings are falling or whether your pop star is going to kill herself or whether you're the reason you believe that narrative every time and the reason you believe magic isn't real is because Hollywood tells you these things so i just think it's all about like the reason you trust the white coat is because there isn't blood and guts all over it it's the same way you trust a white coat for a chef there isn't food all over it <laughs> which is counterintuitive right like you almost want to see a chef with a with like stuff all over their clothes from the sauce bubbling and popping and I, I don't know. I guess he wouldn't want to go into the doctor's <laughs> office, though, and see, like, brain matter or something on him. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. I'm warmed up now. <laughs> no, they say that's how careful, like, a real chef is with your food. They want you to see that how clean their white is is how clean their kitchen is. Mm -hmm. Like, everything back there is how you would picture it in an operating room. I don't think I've ever been able to afford a, a kind of kitchen like that or like a <laughs> restaurant like that. Usually, yeah, if I go back there, I, I know what I'm going to see. <laughs> it's one of my favorite arts. <laughs> one of my favorite magics is um, cooking. But I like being a sous chef under a chef. Why do you think uh, Weinstein got outed? If if it's all like a big game and, and, you know, they've all got the money, do you think he was like a sacrificial lamb? Do you think that he pissed somebody off behind the scenes and they were like, it's your turn to go? Uh, or do you think that they're, you know, do you have any specific thoughts about it? I actually, I think like the hindsight is 2020 and the, everything they rolled in on us. I think the entirety of North Korea is fake. I think it's an entire CIA operation. And that's why I think Donald Trump stepping over the sandbags was a really big like, ha ha, you take a movie actor and you put him in a wag the dog type movie that we've been in for the however many decades. And he just is like, look at right on the movie set, I walk over. So one of the things they told us way back when, one of the big huge fear factors, but really it was just a test to see if we would watch movies inside our house that they told us were going to come out at the movie theater is the movie The Interview with James Franco and Seth Rogen. Right. Both 
key. You can look up James Franco, tons of weird pedophilia, like sending pictures of himself and child weird stuff to Wait, young which people. Which sucks because this is one of the best movies I've ever put out. I think it's like this movie and then Citizen Kane and then Demolition Man. <laughs> so what with North Korea where uh where the interview, so go, yeah. Yeah, so they go to Kim Jong un but one of the things is they test us to see if we'll all watch it on our TV and pay five dollars. Like it was them testing Hollywood to see it can we let the movie theater business go? Can we just convince them not only to work in their house, but to watch movies in their house and to eat in their house and to only never go see anyone, just live inside their cell? Can we Okay, hold on. I feel personally attacked because <laughs> as long as I can remember I've always preferred to watch movies at home. I hated going to the theater because I'd always have to like pee halfway through and then you got to decide like which scene you're going to miss uh, to like, I don't know. I just I always felt I like, like I needed the movie a pause theater button. Either. <laughs> I don't like it just because I don't want to hear other people cough and sneeze. But there must be an energy of watching the movie like a concert. You know, I don't always want to listen to my music with a whole bunch of other people around. But every once in a while, I understand the beauty of a concert. Um, but I think that interview was just, yeah, (laughs) yeah, totally. That's the, like my bread and circus. Um, but I think that they were just testing with that if we'd all go. So in the Sony music hacks that or in the Sony movie hacks, cause it was a whole bunch of hacks that were going on and they blamed it on North Korea. It was part of the whole WikiLeaks thing. So, uh, North Korea were like, oh my gosh, they're bad guys. Oh my gosh, Kim Jong-un. And so they put all this stuff out. So that's how we find out about Harvey Weinstein. But they already have it planned on the other side because Rose McGowan and Asia Argenta are already going to come out with the Me Too movement. So the way they bury all the pedophilia in Hollywood is by having a whole bunch of grown women that got on a casting couch out of their own grown woman. Like they made the decision to do it, but it buried it because they did it out of power and you know louis ck jerked off in front of me even though i said it was okay and me too me too me too when there was actually real problems in the world of ladies having to deal with real stuff at work that wasn't all this hollywood casting couch stuff and no one ever asked angelina jolie and jennifer lawrence hey what was it like to sleep with harvey weinstein and become the a number one actress what if it was great what if they were like to be honest it was it was the best they're like he had the biggest (laughs) clit i ever seen and it was a may (laughs) <laughs> but yeah i just think something is we all like looked at these couple of hollywood people we never heard of before that said this stuff about a potato dick guy and then over here there's all these celebrity women that he obviously made a-list actresses for doing it and no one questioned it so i was just like they showed us exactly how hollywood works and nobody asked about the kids and so That's Corey feldman had this fake point. thing over here and he looked all silly because the only person he outed was Charlie Sheen, which I don't, I think Charlie Sheen was the fall guy in that because he was going to say Steven Spielberg. Um, but I just, so I just think all that was all mixed together at the same time. So they could. Bury. It was like a cathartic release. It was yeah. like, you guys are, are worked up over this. Here's like, like a, a much more palpable version that we can all talk about around the water cooler that doesn't get into the icky parts and you can kind of like live through this. Uh, this is one that uh, I guess I'm just like wildly speculating. We're just ranting at this yeah, point, yeah. <laughs> but it was it's crazy to me how like the Rose McGowan thing. She became like this this leading voice, but she was also acting as like this underdog, where it's like she's the voice that they're obviously all projecting and they're all repeating, but also she's not allowed in the club. She's you know offended people. Um, but she was she was like a, an early girlfriend of like Marilyn Manson, and so was uh, what's uh, Rachel or Evan Rachel Woods. Evan Rachel, yeah, what? So Dita they were Von both Tease or something. She well, okay, yeah, a so strong, yeah. So it, I don't know. This this might just sound flippant, and this isn't like you're asking for it rhetoric, but like you uh, you went out with Marilyn Manson as he was Marilyn Manson because he was like that since he was you know seventeen or whatever. And then they're like, I can't believe the depravity. I can't believe the way that he (laughs) treated me. Like it was, he had no respect for me. And it's like the dude, like, you know, you walk in and he's just like cutting himself for pleasure and like bleeding. And it's like, I can't believe that guy never considered my feelings. And then he wanted to choke me and pour blood in my mouth. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And I don't know. I, I guess I wonder like why, how did it become that, that they, you know, 
become like the leading, I guess, actors or actresses of, of this movement. I, is it because that they've seen like the ultimate depravity of it or I don't like were they recruited for the job? Did they just say, Hey, here's something I can latch onto and get more attention or, or I don't know. I, I don't know where I'm going with it. It's just, it's, it's so like, weird though. So you have there, the world is more fearful of North Korea. That's going on in the one thing uh okay. rose mcgowan she's i think it's interesting too she's played a witch on tv um so she her career is whatever but she gets like held up as like she's the Sinead o'connor mad one asia argenta is with anthony bourdain and gets accused of being a pedophile herself and seducing a young boy when she was grown and then look what happens to anthony bourdain he quote unquote what david carradine's himself he red ties himself to a doorknob so it's like oh, was that is that the story on how he went out was it was it an autoerotic asphyxiation he suicide they just said okay he suicide I, I think carradine was like an axe i i don't know i don't know my <laughs> celebrity suicides well enough but i thought that i want to say joke i guess but that david carradine accidentally killed himself because Didn't he was he kill like himself in a weird country in a hotel room maybe it's it seemed like something out of like, I just Hunter feel like Biden's you probably memoirs. yeah you don't go to another country that's probably um one of the biggest countries for sex tourism and jerk off and choke yourself in a hotel room that's no, not getting, this, this is what elon musk was uh criticizing that diver over too he's like hey dude what are you doing mm -hmm. over there anyways <laughs> yeah well that why are you taking ki kids all the way into a cave? but <laughs> yeah. then it's like hey elon how long have you had twitter now and you've spent all this time i've lost an account since it's been quote unquote x but uh there is nothing i haven't heard hell or high water about him releasing anything or him finding files of n really not any no kind of uh child porn was spread between anyone on twitter platform that you now have proof of and you're gonna release to the fuzz somewhere oh okay like you never hear about that like taking control of a company and then like look at all this dirty shit i found in the back well it's, it's worth so much money though like it wouldn't be worth anything if you just turned it directly over to the state department well who was the i mean i don't know his name but there was the guy that got like uh caught on the phone because he was on his way out and he was basically like taking offers for who he might transfer his power to uh, Bl uh rob blagojevich or something uh chicago i think it was chicago uh, but I mean, it's it seems like it's just every once in a while someone will get caught and then they'll get outed to make it seem like, see, you know, we we keep everything above board here that like, see, we caught that guy. That guy's out. So clearly he was the one. He was the only one that was doing this. The bad apples out of here. Oh, my gosh. To add to the Me Too movement at the exact same time, pink pussy hats. And Trump. So you have this like they didn't there was a million ladies marching in every city, maybe across the world, because he said grab them by the pussy. And they didn't even know why they were marching. <laughs> they why were, were they just, marching? I have no idea. They were just mad women because of me too and Donald Trump grab them by the pussy. And North Korea and missiles, which was phallic, and all this is happening, and we're all scared of missiles. <laughs> I want to I want to jump to something because this this came up recently. Nuclear weapons aren't even real. This is a, a new one to me, but I've heard it often. Where's your what's your take on this? Where did it come from? What's your take? I think nuclear power is real. Nuclear weapons aren't real. Okay. So so the the whole like um we can't let such and such country get their hands on a nuke and they can't get this technology. Is that just going to be like the the forever evergreen boogeyman where, you know, up oh, there, they've almost got it. If they just get this one extra special piece of equipment, then they're going to have it. So now we need to go to war or, you know, what's the end game? Because at, at a and certain only point, these countries can have it. Only these certain countries are allowed to in the grand scheme of things have these enough nukes. And we've heard since the 80s, there's enough nuclear weapons on the planet to destroy the world. Blank times over like what <laughs> it's so silly it's the same as the comet coming from space to destroy the dinosaurs it's the exact equivalent 
of look at here's the spot on the planet that we just figured out where the crater went you mean the same spot a kid would be like that looks round <laughs> Yeah, the, like, the, the Chicxulub crater, however you pronounce it. They are like, ja Japan discovered 700 new islands. Like we've had all, there's a satellite, they tell us, like Elon Musk has shot off string after string after string after string. There's a satellite everywhere on the whole planet going around forever. Even pirate ships, who knows how long, Phoenician maps. 700 new islands are discovered <laughs> just in the last year. But we know from a tin can that was shot out before we were born is past some planet in the solar system that sends back zeros and ones and we now have a picture of an atmosphere and an emer in like what kind of oh we know this is a gaseous planet with this kind of things and here's the colors it would emit from these zeros and ones that come from a tin can that was shot out before we were born it is the so ludicrous the, the, <laughs> the zeros and ones thing gets into the like I would say like a slippery slope area because if you could say, okay, yeah, then the, it's all, it's all sort of just ones and zeros that are then being interpreted by some software. And then that software is like, Hey, look, here's this blue planet. Um, but it's not actually the blue planet because it was just doing like a math calculation and then decides, okay, I'm going to show this stupid human like a blue circle because they don't understand the math that I'm about to tell them. And then we're like, Ooh, blue circle planet, blue circle. But if, if you can already give yourself up to like, okay, maybe that's BS, uh, almost in like a Rene Descartes way where it's like, um, I bring this up far too often, but he, he came up with this premise that I can't trust anything that my eyes see because it might just be my optic nerve just like vibrating. Like, you know, maybe like a truck drove by and it vibrated my optic nerve and that's what made me see this thing that's not really there and his... Uh, his his really oversimplified premise was that you get hit in the back of the head really hard you'll usually see like white and this is almost like if you were to turn every pixel on your your screen on it would just be full white for a second and then go back off and that's kind of like that optic nerve it's like you're just jostling it and you just like make them all fire off real quick and that if that's the case then how can you prove that that planet you're seeing is actually a blue planet and it's not just because your your specific optic nerve happens to vibrate in a certain way when it gets triggered by some light out here and then it's it's like no, nothing is real essentially right it, it's like og simulation theory so to me there's a slippery slope between nasa's projecting holograms and then nothing's real i'm just a brain inside of a jar somewhere like I, do, do you ever think like do you ever keep yourself between those bounds have you ever gone off the deep end into like the simulation theory and no one's real and you're just here for my entertainment um there's some part of like and it's not even a moral thing some part of like as i undo my brainwashing there's some part of me where i feel really dense sometimes I feel dense and i'm like damn i'm an asshole but it's just like this dense even when i'm if i'm not in contact with anyone just my internal dialogue is so intense and dense and then sometimes i'm really light in love and i'm feeling but i'm never evil and so there's this thing that i just with the universe or with the debate of anything when everyone's like the law of one or goes to the singularity idea i just think there is energy in this realm that has separated itself from predator or prey, density or light, creator or destroyer. There's something that is evil. And I don't like the word evil because it seems so simple, but I do think whatever existence that we kind of fucking live in, even if it, I don't believe we're in the computer now because it doesn't make sense to me that we were the generation that would have required the most amount of computer power. That doesn't make sense. They stopped at the X generation and here we are about to go on to the everything app, which is X. So you could get into the whole symbolism of that. But it's like we were the last ones to play in the sun. So now the simulation needs so much more power and people would argue that there's more people. So the simulation needs to slowly, what, sit everyone in their chairs because it doesn't have enough power to run and let everybody play outside anymore. Like the power slowly dimming on the simulation. But 
and that everyone's like, oh, you need evil to, you know, that's part, that's the opposite of love. It's the boundary, yeah. It's, it's the yeah, black line that, like, that keeps in the other, the, the yin and the yang, right? I, I feel like it's outside of it. It's like so to- totally different. Like a tiger would be density and a deer would be light. But it's really just predator and prey. Then there's a poacher separate of those things that kills them both for fun and walks away. It doesn't well, need anything from them. Well, let me throw in taking. just like a house cat that goes and just like kills a baby rabbit, doesn't eat it, just kills it to to play with the carcass just and then play. runs they... away. Do you do you think that that's the same thing? Do you do you think that an animal could want to kill something just for fun in like an immoral way, or do you think that animals are absolved from immorality, or they have no understanding that it's not just because? This is a weird thing about cats <laughs> that I watch them sometimes, even with a toy. They're the one providing the energy to the thing. So sometimes I think they actually play with things to death. Like house cats, too, maybe like humans in a lot of ways, they're not the real version of the cat. Like a tiger doesn't just kill for fun. And there's exceptions to these rules. So I hate when people write me later on and they're like, look, at here's a picture of a. And I'm like, I understand the exception to the rule, but a tiger doesn't typically kill for fun. But a house cat, we've f- neutered it of all of its normal things that it has to do. And so I would say it has some kind of weird internal mental anxieties, but I would say the same for people. Like we've taken away whatever it meant for humans to be humans. And so s- slowly they're like hitting other humans up in the air and being like, oh, am I providing this thing energy or is it really alive? Or they're hitting traumas up in the air. Am I providing this thing energy or is it still alive? And now there's no difference of a a real actual mouse with life in it and a dead thing that you're hitting up in the air and you're providing all the excitement. I feel a lot of people are carrying on relationships like that. (laughs) You know, we're like, yeah, like your violence is basically sharing your energy. It's like, hey, I'm going to share some of this energy with you, uh, but you're killing. And which is, it's a weird because there's also that kind of like an old wives tale about a cat that sits on your chest and steals your breath while you're sleeping. Um, where like they. Cat's eye. Cats that's the are. Cat's eye movie. Oh, is that what that is? Is that where that's from? <laughs> I've heard that so many, and I, I think it's also in the. Uh, oh man, the hole. There, there was a movie where like these kids find like a big um, hole in like their backyard, the pit or something. Anyways, I remember the Omen. Was it the Omen that they they di- played with a Ouija board? These kids played with a Ouija board, and then like a pit to hell open, and then they played light as a feather, stiff as a board, and then yes, like, a pit to hell opened up in their backyard. Yeah, like like the the parents go away, and like the sisters' friends are all doing it, it wasn't and then, the like the Omen, the Omen, it, like no, it's not the Omen. I think it was called the pit or the hole or just, anyways. Um, so actually, perfect segue. What about Ouija boards? Do you think a Ouija board? Because that's the the typical uh, it, the movie trope is that some innocent you know kid or some innocent virgin comes across a Ouija board and then inadvertently invites like a demon in and they they usually break one of the rules one of the rules like you don't use it alone you always say goodbye there's like things that you can and can't do with it and if you violate those rules now all of a sudden there's like a ghost in your house or you're gonna be possessed I'm curious do you think that Ouija boards ever worked? Like there has there ever been like a real, and I, and I don't mean like um like runes and like an ancient sort of like fortune telling with bones. I mean like a Ouija board that someone said we're gonna put this in a store and make some profit off of it. Do you think anyone's actually talked to a a spirit through one of those? The number one person they use to tell us that the spirit world doesn't exist is Harry Houdini, and I feel like the number one people on the planet they use to show us that magic isn't real is magicians and so i think harry houdini is probably in a lot of ways there could be argument like a perfect super spy like a perfect cia back then like he was all spread around even down to his death at the end like everything like harry houdini is a whole rabbit hole and so 
I think everything that you lay out a surface for, tarot cards, you have to put it on a sacred surface. So I would say not only the Ouija board, you're doing some kind of spell. I would say your Monopoly game, you're doing a spell. I would say your Sorry game, you're doing a spell. I would say your Candyland, you're doing a spell. And so I think if we were putting on a battle back when chess is a spell black and white checkerboard all the things are knights and rooks and queens and kings and if we were putting on a battle back when and i was one of your highest people in your court we would carve figures out of every other general and king and knight on their other things so in detail and we would lay it out and we would play out the battle so many times that we would larp the battle we would put energy into it some say we might plan a technique but we were seeing ourselves winning over and over again almost like that and quote unquote eye of the tiger <laughs> like you know you're getting it dun 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 and so i think that kind of seeing things yeah a ouija board you are doing something. I do think there's rules about playing with things that people don't understand. And I think even kids, before a parent ever tells them, before they see it anywhere, like one kid has it and they're like, we should do the Ouija board. There's something instinctively in a little kid when they're playing with it. Before anyone tells you it's wrong, it just feels powerful in a way that you're like, oh, am I allowed to be doing this? Like you ask yourself in your little ki tiny kid brain, like, and I think that little kid brain is the actual smarter brain in the world we live in now. I feel like they tried to get you away from believing any of that stuff. Well, I mean, cause there's like a, a lot of woo woo takes on that where the, the kids are more pure because they just came from the spirit world and they haven't been here long enough to kind of get like dragged through. And then the, also the like think as a child mentality where you're accepting of everything and it's before you've you've developed a whole bunch of biases and um, sort of like these preconceived notions so you're always in learning mode and you're never in ignoring mode um but i mean there's also some naivety in there too right like a, like kids left to their own devices just die like they don't they don't exist or or survive for very long so there's a little bit of I mean, maybe this is controversial. There's like a little bit of programming they kind of have to know. Like, I guess a, a, a simple example would be like, look both ways before crossing the street. And if you don't do that enough, you, I don't know, maybe you get smacked or you get grounded or whatever the uh, the corrective procedure is there, right? So we that's like in the family monkeys? unit. What's that? Do you think we have 100 monkeys or do you think everything comes from our parents or the adults around us? Uh, it's a it's a good question because that's also a very controversial other end of the pendulum swinging because because right now I'll answer that but right now it's like the, they're trying to destroy the family unit you know once the family unit's gone then all hell breaks loose chaos communism atheism like just everything happens the moment that like the last kid is separated from the last family right yeah. but then on the other end of the, the pendulum it's like it takes a village and we should all raise everyone together and share things and, you know, divorce your parents. Remember the, the Stephen Molyneux uh -huh. uh, movement of, so I, I think that the answer is like somewhere in between those two and they're both extremes. I don't know what the right answer is. I do think you can be screwed up by your family. I also think you can be screwed up by not having a family. Um, and, and, let me let me try to answer this in a very cryptic way and hopefully this comes through this is something that someone told me a long time ago it's that's really stuck with me it's an absolute mind fuck but the it was a very socratic form of questioning and actually let me just let me just pose it to you and see if it works on you so can you think <laughs> in a time in your life than someone that you absolutely trusted like a really good friend family member someone you had all your trust in just let you down in a in a huge way. Can you think of a time yes. that happened? Okay, yes. uh, everyone yeah. can say yes. Can you think of a time when an absolute stranger that you've never met just showed a complete, you know, um, like good faith towards you, like like someone just helped you out, yeah, in a horrible time and never expected anything. You never saw him again. Yeah. Also, yes, right. So, does this not imply that? you could just as well trust an absolute stranger with something extremely important more so than someone that you think that is your best friend or your family that you could always rely on. 
So just just that dynamic that a complete stranger has the potential to be better to me than somebody that I would put all of my faith into. That's not to say screw all of your friends and screw yeah. your family that weren't there when they were there for you. But it is almost like this, this switch out of instead of looking around like everyone's out to get me, that guy would screw me over the first chance he had. There's actually a very high probability that uh, that that guy or you know that lady that like you're you're stink eyeing might legitimately be really helpful to you. Might be the nicest person and the most helpful person you've ever met. And a good um, but chance if you've got that no they reason, would run in a burning building and save you if they didn't know who you were but just saw the building on fire. E exactly. Exactly. And and I guess the point here is that. I guess in in like our our monkey brains, and I I think maybe we came from monkeys. We'll get into that too. But like in our in our <laughs> monkey brains, you somehow are like, no, I've known this person for five years, ten years, so I I can definitely trust them more because I've invested more time, right? Like I've I've paid more into this insurance policy, so this is the better one for me. I'm not going to trust some random person I've never met, but that that's so incorrect right it's a thing that that you believe based on your emotions and based on your weird memory and i'm and i'm hoping to get into this answer of like maybe maybe it's a hundred monkeys maybe it's just your parents um but it, but there's also a lot to be said about like if both your parents are those random strangers that would be nice to everyone that's way different than having two parents that you can rely on but are also scumbags you know what i mean like yeah. it, it's it's really hard to answer because it's not complete or binary you were like a human and you were raised by wolves how much of your human would still come out that you might teach the wolves things or like if you didn't have anyone around like you were just you know a baby and you got dropped off and by the grace of whatever got lived until you were five years old six yeah, years old. They're, they're out there feral children kind of like yeah. fargo-esque so it's like what things are in us that we already kind of really know because even the idea of like family unit i would say it takes a village and they went from us being like almost thinking there was a god in everything to thinking there was one god of everything to thinking that we're the god of everything and so i almost feel like in the family way that we used to think like this was my family and now then we thought like oh you know you can even go to like tribal and then you go to like some idea of like world war ii maybe even like a big multi-family house in like boston where like the aunt but the uncle died in war and the like sister and her new husband are there and there's like you know that and then it's the nuclear family so we have this word nuclear again and now it's 2.5 kids and a white picket fence and that really we just know they're like they just wanted to get everyone out of the cities into the suburbs like huh did they just want to get everyone out into the cities into the suburbs because it seems like they want us back in the cities to me no they wanted everyone to get in debt and the 2.5 kids mean you could never tend a farm like you didn't you could never take care of yourselves like you could off the land and then we saw like any rents every time the people tried to go back to that idea of community living they destroyed it by giving us some version of hollywood to be like look at these cults look at how commune communism Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I mean, to get into like the even deeper aspect of this, I really, I truly personally believe there's like a Hegelian dialectic um, aspect where they like the communism, capitalism thing right here. That'll be a good example. Yeah. So those are the two ends of the, of the extremes. And some people you talk to are like capitalism is, you know, that's what the globalists are going to use to send everyone into poverty and then take over. But then they're going to sell us on communism. So, like, what are they? Are they capitalists or are they communists at heart? Um, and, I, and I think that the Hegelian aspect of that is, like, here's, this, here's two things that could work in a vacuum, which we don't live in, right? But maybe, cap like, unfettered capitalism, but without corruption, which doesn't exist because humans are involved. Yeah. And then you've got communism, which might exist on paper, um, but that's only if you don't account for human uh, greed, right? And like the like my self preservation 
meaning that I'm going to hoard a bunch of food so I don't get hungry and I don't really care about all of my neighbors. So those two ends of the spectrum, if you can keep people saying like, that's what communism is and then that's what capitalism is. So they're like, no one will ever decide, right? Like I'll never be like, vanilla is not my favorite because every time you've ever been served vanilla, it's always got like a nasty little chunk of like ice in it or like, you know, or whatever, like you get the chocolate, but it's always like the nasty flavor. So people start to develop these tastes or distastes for these, these far ends of the extreme. So I think that that might be part of it, but the, I guess the question here being that, is there like a capitalist or communist answer? Is that like, is the new world order one of those two things? Like, is it really like the, the Bavarian Illuminati wants us all to be communist or is it in between those? I feel like the idea of communism is always with the idea of scarcity. Like bread lines, you're going to be standing. But I don't know if capitalism is the opposite of communism. I would say maybe like a dictatorship would be the opposite of communism. Because capitalism, everybody always, because we know crony capitalism that we're in now, but really if we were in a village and you know, I made swords and, you know, my family made swords for all these years and I wouldn't let you ever metal smith under me and never let you, you know, do any of it. And, you know, eventually your family and you taught your kid how to make swords and your swords were better and superior to my swords. And you were like, hey, I'm going to charge a little more for my swords. They take me a little more time. They're out of better material. I don't think that would be a bad thing. It makes me either make my swords better or I go out of business. But the par problem was is that somewhere a king came in and said, no, sorry, you guys, no matter what, no matter how hard it is, no matter how expensive the metal gets, no matter how expensive the wood for the fire gets, we're always going to help Chaney out because she's too big to fail. <laughs> Like capitalism got screwed in this way that it just became another thing. And communism got screwed in this way that it just became another thing. What I would say they're both dictatorships, like the what, what we live under now. And I'm anti-communist of the idea of what's yours is should be yours. Whatever you work for, whatever you build, it should be yours. But I don't care. I want to be able to help people in a way like oh yeah if you don't have enough to eat but the idea of like where people are like oh universal income should people have universal food like should there just be universal groceries that get dropped off at people's houses instead of an income wouldn't that be maybe. a better way but yeah maybe wouldn't the universal food be a better idea and like scarcity is not real and so you'll you'd have to append it to be like universal food and shelter i think if you, if they had that that's probably the close that's the closest to the practical rollout but also it's it's already problematic like the second that you say universal food and shelter then it's it's almost like the minimum wage um argument all over again well it's like well yeah but is that really living and it's like well i mean kind of it kind of is living like if you're if it's keeping you from dying then yeah it's living but um it, it's not it's not what people would probably consider humane and i think that that universal basic income would it would be this like unattainable always sliding scale where someone's always gonna be like it's not enough you know what i mean and then for as many people saying that they'll be like oh it's it's too much it it's the a price weird of thing. Everything will go up a little because the yeah. people that are bad with money are still going to be bad with money. Right, right. <laughs> but if it was just food, if it was just like you always have a guaranteed place, a safe place to sleep, and you always have guaranteed like food that won't kill you, that might be better than UBI. But man, I don't know. I, honestly, the more I think about that, I'd, I'll probably be like, that's New World Order stuff. But I mean, <laughs> there's. No, I just think really everybody keep that shit local the second you say anything universal or when they're like federal government or where they're like Ugh, it just gets too even statey feels too big for me like what what do you need food from india for what do you need clothes from china for what do you need a car from alaska for what do you need a like so why can't I have you spend to say, your money local I mean, I know those are rhetorical questions, but just as, as being someone that's lived in both Florida and New York, the difference between a piece of corn that you get from New York and a piece of corn you get from Florida or tomatoes 
it's like not even the same thing. So I, I mean, somewhat in jest, but I'm, but like, yeah, I mean, does that mean I just, I'll never get to eat like a certain type of fruit. I just never get to have a kiwi because I just happen you, to be when outside. You have it, it's like the people wonder like, where are all these allergies come from? Where are all these things come from? Well, maybe you're eating food that you, from a season that you're not in from a country you've never been to You're nothing in your body knows how to produce or uh, decompose or process that thing. It's just like you're putting in literally a genetically modified food from a country that you may never go to from a type of year and a climate that your body and skin is never going to be in. And then you're like, gosh, what's wrong with my stomach? Why is my skin itchy? Why am I <laughs> coughing? Why am I doing these things? And so I'm like, maybe people need to eat more local food. And maybe if you're in a place like New York City and all your food has to get shipped in, that's the reason you have such high anxiety because your human animal knows, oh, there isn't enough water and food around here for me to survive if shit were to hit the fan. And so when you live in a place like Florida where you can stick a stick and a string into any waterway and feed your family, it gives you a little, everyone's like, gosh, everyone just walks around like they're retired here um, because you can feed yourself and water yourself if need be. Like that's it, a that's a good like, point. You always see someone fishing on the side of the road in Florida. I don't care where you're at. Sometimes on like the side of I four, yeah, and you're like, matter. "Don't eat that, dude! Don't <laughs> a eat lake it. that you're like, huh? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know anyone would ever fish there. It's it's honestly not even water in there. It's just the runoff of like fertilizer. But people still fish directly out of it. Yeah, it's it's a Florida man thing. I think we're just we're built different. <laughs> <laughs> but there's so many swamps and so many waterways and so much ocean and so much. I mean, even if you go into the center of it, if shit hit the fan, how many how long could we eat on gators? How long could we eat on snake? How long could you eat on? I mean, seriously, the amount of where if you live in the middle of Los Angeles and your city gets shut down like we've had without power in Florida for nine days. Uh, imagine without power in Chicago for nine days. Imagine without power in New York for nine days. You think FEMA can get in enough trucks? Like, nah, dog. <laughs> the, there's nah, something, dog. yeah, not a lot of people understand this, but it's like when, um, I mean, we have hurricane season every year. Like, it, it's like it never takes a year off. We might have a year that hurricanes don't hit, right? And there's not like a huge storm to deal with. But hurricane season happens every year and there's there are like power and, and contractors from all the bordering states that are like waiting for a storm to hit the Florida because they all just drive immediately into the state and they're putting back up the infrastructure immediately because it's almost like a seasonal industry. Like, you know, that when you get that call, you're like, hell yeah, I'm getting paid. I'm going to uh -huh. be getting paid overtime. So there's this aspect and, it, and it's not even that like Florida has like our shit figured out we kind of don't in a lot of ways you know what i mean like the the anyways the <laughs> thing is that this is one aspect maybe capitalism right like it's like i know i will get paid if i just go to this place and and help this thing out and get this power back up and it's mutually beneficial there's also a little subsidization here because it's not like they're coming to fix your power directly they're doing it for the the state infrastructure and they get nice kickbacks for that but the the point being is that we have like a whole system sorted out. So when the power grid goes down, like it goes down so often that we're like, okay, go and do that thing again. When it happens in another area, like, like Texas has a brownout or like, you know, Georgia gets hit or what was the hurricane that went up and hit like New Jersey for the first time in like a hundred years. And no one really understands how to do any of that. Um, another thing too, when people like will move to Florida for the first time, there's always all these people that die during a storm because they like ran their generator inside because they've just never <laughs> been through it. Another dead giveaway is like the people that put up like wood on the windows. You're like, oh, you must have not lived here for more than five years. It's like this <laughs> joke of like of like I'm more tough than you because I'm more willing to have my my windows blown out. But it's it's really more like after you've put them up and taken them down for the 20th time, you're just like, whatever, like let, let the storm take the window out. And you're like, eh, cat too. Psh. You start like the wind 
start you you start having a realer idea you're like we get 60 mile an hour winds just on a random wednesday <laughs> like you're like this is going to get up to 80 we'll be fine and then you're like the longer it sits the more it's going to flood you start you know as a floridian the real problems of it uh, different than what the news is telling you you're like right. okay we're not going to have power it's going to get hella hot really fast you got to have your flashlight you got to have your jenny like you're so excited that's what i call my generator my jenny <laughs> it hey, is jenny it's, girl. It's, <laughs> it's it's a weird thing like sometimes you're like looking forward to proving that all of like your generators and your bottles of water and like your uh your prepper food that's like you know add water and dehydrate you're like yeah it was a good idea that i've had mres this whole time so <laughs> part of you like wants it to happen part of you like wants to get hit but also like you definitely don't want to get hit because it is very inconvenient and expensive but um the the the, the ultimate point though is that i think that there's like a weird resilience that you build up. I'm constantly being traumatized every single year. It's almost like you you develop these scars over it. You don't and... talk to your neighbor at all. I don't talk to my neighbor until the one time a year I got to go help her put her old lady right. boards up. <laughs> right. Or, or man, that would be like a weird time when like one side of the street has no power and the other one does. And now people are like friendly running again. Cords. because Yeah, running cords <laughs> back and forth. But uh, and that's kind of like the shared trauma event too right so i wonder like those are good and bad to me if they're orchestrated maybe it's bad but it's also good in that i think that humans we kind of program ourselves through trauma events i think that when you're born that's a huge traumatic event um and then even like when like good things happen to you as you're growing up those are all traumatic experiences in a way and those are kind of like the miles uh, i refer to like like a checkpoint when you're playing a video game like every time you go through like a major traumatic event good or bad that's a checkpoint that like if you reset or you screw up when you want to get back to like the last time that you knew where you were at you kind of go back to those checkpoints and with florida like we have a checkpoint every year, at least one. There's some places that you can live in this country that you never really have one of those checkpoints. And it's it's a different reality. Like I don't know what that reality is where I can't live. And, and at the same time, Florida, we have less checkpoints because we don't have seasons. So it's like our yeah. seasons are, is, there a, is it hurricane season or is it not hurricane season? And it kind of alternates between those two. It, I, I believe in weather manipulation and weather control and there's so much proof of it. This being said, I also see a whole bunch of people move to Florida every year because of everything we know about chemtrails and stuff. And they're like, look at this storm. Look at this. Look at this. Oh, my gosh, it's going to hit here. Oh, my gosh, it's going to hit there. Oh, my. Look at the shape of your state, especially if you're on a seaboard. Like they're making all this big deal right now. They're like, oh, my gosh, there's hurricanes. You know, there's like typhoons in, you know, California. This hasn't happened since this year. Oh, my gosh. They're like, Kevin, ah, ah. like they, they can't even believe it. And it's like, look at the shape of the Baja. That shows you that storms have gone up and hit there so many times. It is wedged out. It's like the reason any bay exists anywhere in the world unless if it's a natural bay tampa san francisco it's because storms have hit there so many times it's drudged out these bays so it's like you can look at the atlantic seaboard of florida and you can look at where the barrier island is and it ha it's really smooth because storms when they usually hit they usually go up the coast or down the coast they rarely hit and go across from the atlantic seaboard they will do it a lot from the uh, Gulf side. That's why it's shaped like that. It's like, so when people are like, oh my gosh, the Carolinas, look at them, their fingers all the way up. They get hit like that. N Manhattan, it's gonna get hit. That's what it does. The sea level's not gonna rise. <laughs> well, not That's until all the thing. polar bears are dead first and then the sea levels start to rise. I'm starting to think polar bears are just like albino bears. And like albino, like, oh, white, you know, grizzly. And uh, they showed us it swimming. And we all believe icebergs melt because we've seen a bear swim. And with, <laughs> with talking over it, look at this iceberg. If they would have said, this polar bear just won the polar bear Olympics, we would have been like, yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> 
Al Gore. <laughs> so I want to get a, a temperature check on you on a couple of different specific conspiracy theories. We talked about Britney Spears. We talked about Hollywood. Uh, let's get into a few other ones. This is a little segment that's called PCP. So we're going to do some PCP really quick. Okay. The rules are that I'm going to just, I'm going to make a statement and you're going to just give me a number from zero to 10 based on how much you agree with that statement. So okay. zero, you don't agree at all. 10, you agree. Five, you're on the fence and we can talk about it. Okay. Make sense? <clears throat> Got it. Let's do it. Hey, conspiracy buffs. I double dare you to take some PCP, the paranormal conspiracy probe. On your marks, get set and go. Statement one. That motherfucker on the back of the plane was not real. Zero. So he was real. I think she wasn't real. I think the whole entire thing was fake. Okay, we're gonna get we're gonna get into that one <laughs> in particular. <laughs> Dinosaurs are real. Zero. There's uh <laughs> I wanna say flat earth, because I always say the same thing. There's more land outside of the Arctic wall that's being hidden from us. We'll say we'll put it that way. Seven. Uh, Disney child actors are raised in an MK Ultra program first and then given over to Hollywood. Eight. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, Ron DeSantis was a better win than Andrew Gillum. This is a Florida only question. Uh, eight. Ghosts, <laughs> ghosts are real. Five. Okay, that, that's that's the topic for. Um, Lee Harvey Oswald was involved in JFK's assassination. Three. <laughs> uh, the Bermuda Triangle was legit, and it wasn't just something. It wasn't just a conspiracy theory for children. Six. <laughs> we buried Osama bin Laden at sea out of respect. Zero. The Titanic was sunk intentionally by J.P. Morgan. Six. We have a way to unfreeze Walt Disney and Ted Williams and everyone else has been frozen. Uh, ten. And then Paul McCartney was replaced with a body double. Uh, six. Let's start with that one and go backwards. Okay. <laughs> so the, the, the Paul McCartney one, I have to admit... It's it's not as interesting to me. It's like I understand if someone told me like Kanye West or someone had been replaced. I care about that more than if Paul McCartney were replaced. And I realize it's just because I didn't grow up listening to the Beatles except to just like feel like I was I was deeper at a certain point. But I was never like big into the Beatles. So Paul McCartney in particular being a body double wouldn't have like shaken my world. But the just the concept that uh, a famous person that everyone sees constantly and has musical ability, some kind of merit, assumedly, that you could just swap them out and the whole world would be none the wiser. This is also mentioned about, we mentioned Britney Spears, right? Like yeah. maybe she's just like a CGI character or something. 2018, so let me... she had a car accident. So, I think so, Kanye so... had a car accident too. Oh my God, he did. Actually, that's, that's a great point. So maybe they, they wait for the car accident and then that happens afterwards. So what are the correlations between Britney and Paul McCartney? Do you think that it's comparable or do you think that there are totally different cases here? Totally different cases. Okay, I, so so break down the Paul McCartney one and why you're a six on that. I almost think I used to be a person that was like, you know, the Beatles are the Beatles. And then I became, you know, you start seeing like all the symbology on all their albums and all the things like that. And then, oh. Paul McCartney fake and so you start looking into that but now I think fall was 
almost like the movie Frozen for Disney. So you can't look it up. Paul McCartney becomes the Beatles conspiracy. That is the cover story, the smoke screen. So now we don't pay attention to, uh, you know, Yoko and John and what's going on there. We don't pay attention to George and what's happening in the Far East. Who is Ringo and why is he ever a Beatle? And, you know, the symbology of what it really means if they're MI6, uh, probably that all the rock bands at the time, like Elvis, the quote unquote king, because I think they these all matter. He had to be taken out of America and moved to Germany so the Beatles could invade America. Like it all happened very like simultaneously. Also, Elvis originally was very anti-vax and he was pro-Negro. This was a big thing for him because he grew up around all these black people and he was also religious. So he's an American, he's pro-God, he's pro-black, and he's anti-vaccine. So they control him by getting the um, colonel to come in and tell him, you shook your hips and you're going to go to jail. But to make you look like a good boy instead, you're going to go to the military. You're going to go to Germany for a few years. And they sit him on TV and he becomes the poster child for vaccines. And they take Elvis and they move him out and they give him a young pedophile. <laughs> you know, they give him a young bride. The Beatles invasion happens in America. Then they can start to human traffic these bands, the guns and drugs and heroines and cocaines and all these big things. And now they can put it wherever they want because no one's paying attention to the circus. No one's looking in the tiger cage to see what's in it. No one's looking behind the elephants to see wh what, what they're carrying. So I just think uh, the Beatles were just a perfect pop invasion to kind of allow parents they were like had a little bit less of their kids culture a little bit less of their music they didn't understand this screaming going on between elvis and the beatles like this seance that had taken jumped into their child and now this long hair oh now there's like these two polar sides of what it means to be an american man we have this hippie coming up and then this oh elvis he was a good american boy he went to war so it's I would just love like... <laughs> there's always this meme. I'm like, what would you do if you had a, like a time machine? And then, you know, like the, 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 the one person's like, I would meet my grandma. Another person's like, I would kill Hitler. <laughs> I would love to just like go back to one of those time period, like, you know, 50s or 60s when people were clutching their pearls over Elvis and then play him like some walk a flock of flame or like some doja cat or something just to get like the true reaction between these two or even even farther back when it was like i'm thinking about maybe divorcing my wife and then the whole town's like you're not allowed to shop here anymore <laughs> right it's like this this huge pendulum swinging back and forth so to to get a question out of that i'm Beatles is a, is a good example. Elvis, I mean, these are like the biggest cultural movements ever. So, of course, there's this huge vested interest. Do you think that it would be possible for a musician anytime from the 60s until now to have like a whole lot of say and like their own opinion and not be co-opted and not ultimately become just like part of the CIA programming, right? Like, could the Beatles have ever been like, just love everybody and love yourself and it not be an Aleister Crowleyan co-opted, you know, let's separate children from their parents kind of deal. Is it even possible for it to get popular and not to happen? Like Bob Dylan, right? Was Is Bob Dylan also kind of a co-opted CIA psyop, even though he was counterculture? Like is, is counterculture possible? Did they make it to the cover of the Rolling Stone? Did they make it to 2020 and Dateline? Did they get to sit down with Barbara Walters? Do they get to sit next to Jay Leno? Do they do they get to shake hands with Howard and John Stewart? Like, I think all, even the Rolling Stone, like those are the planets, those are the stars that you were never supposed to follow. The Rolling Stones. Like it even, I think maybe it's biblical or I don't, I don't even want to say what book it is that you're not, you're not supposed to follow the wandering stars. And that was the planets because the other uh, horoscopes were fixed in the sky with a story, but the planets did their own thing with their own energies. So I kind of think like all the Rolling Stones, all the movements, all of the, if you are allowed to be famous, if Hollywood turns their chair for you you didn't make it to the stage for them to turn their chair of like the American Idol. They already knew the final eight were going to be the final eight. 
your friend might have auditioned for American Idol too. <laughs> like, yeah, but they were never going to be the final eight. And then I think there's some people, like you said um, earlier, is where's the, if I have all your secrets, like if I, Elon Musk, and I take over Twitter and I figure out like, you know, Pizzagate all over in Twitter and it's all real, where's the control? I have the honeypot now. Like I'm Hugh Hefner. I have all the secrets. I have the cameras in the room. I'm Epstein. So it's kind of like, are they going to ever say it or do they lose their power? <laughs> Everything seems like every, if, if it's magic, if it's space, if it's technology, if it's Masonic rituals of time, you know, like that's the power. That's a good question. Like let's say Oprah invites you on the show or like you write a book and now Oprah suggests you you're on the book club. Does her inviting you dilute, your work because now it's like being you know like blended with all the other top 40 um mass consumption stuff or you don't get it picked unless you've already fit that mold of mass consumption yeah i think like oprah's favorite things aren't because oprah ever used them i think we got comfortable for 20 years of oprah showing us her favorite vacuum and her favorite tv show and her favorite book and then one day she picked our president for us and we were like this is just normal oprah tells us what to do and i think they were going to use her this time her in the rock to stand by the maui fires and just be like oh oprah tells you they're saving things they're doing this but i think they're losing their magical spell like the hollywood of it all the wand is broken so uh, i've i've got many many flaws one of my many <laughs> flaws is that i don't care enough about current events as maybe i should sometimes it's weird because specifically in like the podcast community and conspiracy podcasts, but podcasts in general, almost everyone's like wanting to talk about the latest thing that happened. And I'm always like, let's dig into this thing that happened 40 years ago because there's like all this research and papers and, but that's not really as fun for people, I guess, to like speculate on where like there's actually facts and research because research and facts are kind of boring and just like spitballing is fun. So, so first I want to spitball. No, but I think that this is what you do so awesome. And this is what I just love. Even if like what everything about adrenochrome is, I think this is how we have to unlearn them is the way they were all brainwashed is the Hollywood is the pop culture is the shit. They're only going to pay attention to the big lessons and the occult and the esoteric stuff we want to try to get into with them if we can walk them in with breadcrumbs. And so I like that you have a pop culture brain also, you know, like you you use both your artist brain and your logic brain to mix together. And so I do think no matter what crazy thing we're talking about that's relevant, this is where I agree with you. And I think it's Gordy from those conspiracy guys that said Shout it. Shout out Gordo, yeah. Yeah, I think he said it once that I just, he said, you know, like, the old stuff will always be like it will have the longer play life and i always thought that about my show like i wanted people if they listened to an episode they'd be able to listen to all of it because yeah there was current stuff going on but a majority of what i was talking about wasn't just this thing like i was talking to you about a thing or going into a conspiracy about a thing so i kind of think like really i just like the pop culture stuff because i feel like it's the way i can relate to them to show them like hey these Maui fires that you're talking about, remember the California fires? Okay, now let's walk further back. Here's an energy weapon. Okay, do you know who Tesla is? Okay, do you know what a laser is? Okay, do you know what a magnifying glass does in the sun? Okay, let's just go into these basic concepts of things. Like, do you know what there's six miles of tunnel system underneath Maui? Let's talk about tunnel systems. Do you know that this ancient tribe was here and was taken over by this whole other thing? Let's talk about that. Do you know some people think Hawaii is an actual actual giant a titan that's laid down and it's one of my favorites head and heart chakra one of my favorites <laughs> i know i'm like so i'm like let's talk about that so i just think i only like the current event so we can talk about how it lays out and patterns of other things we can remember i so, amen i i think i like that and it also justifies that me not staying as up to date on current events as much speaking of the maui thing 
Where are you at on this like blue laser, blue uh, roof, blue umbrella stuff? Do you know what I'm talking about, first mm-hmm. of all? And yes. so, so just to yeah. catch anyone up that's like, what the hell are you talking about? There's this theory that Maui was attacked by a, a, a dew drop, a direct energy beam that came from, I don't know, like a Jewish space laser or something. But because Oprah's house had a blue roof or whatever, a certain colored roof, and because some resorts had blue umbrellas they were like immune to the death ray you know like it was it was like saying you know don't shoot me or it was just like a a perfect little preventative you know umbrella for lasers is any of that legit is that to make people uh get laughed at is like some of it real like is the science real but they didn't do it that way like what what's the deal with the with the dewdrop stuff i have been i've read stuff that and i this is so layman's terms because i'm really awful at technical stuff if it's out of my wheelhouse i'm sometimes the details get (laughs) there whatever you set your laser to like whatever color the laser is itself is Mm -hmm. what color it wouldn't burn right so this laser would be a blue beam laser so operation blue beam some people theorize that maybe we've been under it and so if this is the clue leading backward now people are starting to look into these other natural disasters that have happened like 9 11 like other things people theorize there might have been an energy weapon like the california fires and they're noticing blue cars and blue tarps and blue and then they're like huh that are like unscathed, right? Compared to everything else. Uh, everything else. So it's not just now the Maui fires that they're realizing it. Almost like the same way we say we do with conspiracies. It's like once you see the pattern, it's hard to unsee the pattern. And then you meet somebody like Paranoid American and they give you a new lens to put in your like microscope and telescope. And you meet Cheney and she gives you a new lens. And you talk to somebody that has a totally different filter where it's like human vibration. And you're like, oh, that... I didn't even think like taking a person if if like you could conceptualize that maybe John Benet Ramsey wouldn't be real. Could you conceptualize that maybe Britney was never real? And then why would they do that? How much control? And then you could see why they would do that. Like it's the same reason they would try to get us to eat artificial meat out of a lab is like, well, that's cheaper to do than having to raise cows and poison them. I mean, like they're already <laughs> eating Taco Bell. It's not that much of a stretch. Yeah, they're eating Taco Bell all the time. There's there's always something a little weird and bony in there, and you go back, you go back. <laughs> you're like, what? I mean, if you lower the price enough, if if that's all your UBI can get you to afford, anyways, then yeah, you're gonna have the the fake meat taco. Taco Bell is sadly exp- everything sadly expensive, and it's it's sad. I even know this, but Taco Bell is like. If you're going to go there and eat Taco Bell with two people, you might as well just go to a real restaurant now. I mean, this is an ultra pro tip, at least for me. But most of the time you can go to like a a legit Mexican restaurant and just order lengua. And it is usually cheaper. It's cow tongue. It's usually cheaper because um, they don't they don't usually offer as much someplace do an upsell if you got like a bunch of like hipsters that are always ordering yeah. it and they're like charge extra but it's usually cheaper and it's like filet mignon it's like the best kind of steak you just got to get over the fact that you're feeling a cow lick your tongue from the top it's because <laughs> it's like little crunch feelers kissing. yeah dude <laughs> <laughs> and uh what so there's one other current event this it'll be a flash in the pan but the burning man i've I've been talking to uh, Andre Zertis. Shout out um, Zertis. He's the, one of the coolest dudes. And he knows a, a lot about Burning Man because I guess he's been there a few times. And he knows people that go there. And I guess... He's a burner. He's That's definitely a burner. <laughs> he, so so growing up, I guess... He's not a virgin burner. <laughs> he's definitely not. No, he's he's been there a few times. I always looked at it as like this hippie thing that like people go out in the desert and... But really, it's almost like the high tech Silicon Valley version of Bohemian Grove, or like that's the way that I've starting to come to understand this. And it makes sense because when you go there, it's always people like showing off these huge technical feats or huge like things that they've constructed. They've spent the whole year making these, you know, VR presentations or like laser light shows and stuff. But then on the other side, it's like, we're going to return back to nature. We're going to bring only the things that we need to sustain us and some lasers, you know what I mean? And like a laser light show. Um, but it, but there's definitely, and 
on the surface, it's so obviously a cremation of care. I mean, it's the Burning Man ritual. It's the Wicker Man ritual. It's the let's take all of our cares for the year and terracotta burn soldier. them and take them back. Yeah, it's terracotta soldier. So it feels to me that like it was never meant for regular people. This was also this like high elite society thing. Like you have to be the kings of Silicon Valley to go here. Just like if you want to go to Bohemian Grove, you kind of got to be the kings of of media or politics or intelligence. Is there even like a normal person version of Burning Man? Or like, do you just do a bonfire in your backyard? I think the co-founder of Burning Man also wrote Fight Club, which I think is super interesting i, I don't know, know if you've ever looked into the cacophony society and it, the cacophony society started out as the suicide club and the suicide club i think it was the suicide club but the suicide club in san francisco they would do these almost like joker-esque like batman where it would be like practical jokes Oh, like Andy Kaufman, weird comedy, but like to the whole of San Francisco, like it was funny to them. And um, uh, supposedly these are like the stories of the mainstream media, but every like the seems, finders. Yeah, it seems all occult ritual to me. Totally. Or like uh, the good fellows. Like it's like one of these secret societies that you're like, huh? So um, the cacophony society, uh, they like start out, they the first effigy that they burnt was in San Francisco, I think, and that so many people showed up, they made it a yearly thing. And uh, if you go to Bernie, man, it is such a classist, classist society still. So you're not allowed to purchase anything. It's a gift society. Um, but I think you can purchase, like it, it's changed a little bit over the years, but you could, uh, you could only purchase coffee and ice for a period of time or only pay with coffee and ice and everything else you had to gift but they're still the elitist silicone people you're talking about where they have the campsites and the generators and the whole laid out like cityscape perfect ebcot center existence and if you see it it's like a half circle almost like the picture of walt disney standing by his dream of the experimental prototype city of tomorrow so it's like the half idea of that so um and it's called black rock city so uh i think um the wicker man of it all they build effigies all these people in the final effigy they put all their dead people inside of it um, all their loved ones that have passed on and they go inside and they cry and they wail and they do all their things. And then at the end, the last day, cause they have a burn every day, the last day it burns and they all howl as it burns like wolves at the Bernie man. And it's so the wicker man. And, um, you could go into the easy things. Like they leave a whole bunch of trash and ruin, uh, <laughs> the lake bed that they're camping in this is where it gets so funny to me that we're seeing these hurricanes come up <laughs> we're seeing this whole different weather cycle happen burning man takes place burning man burning man takes place in a fucking lake bed and so <laughs> now what happens you know because you're a floridian some things can look really dry and they get that kind of crusty look on the top of them but when moisture comes back to that, that's a mud you've never known. That's a mud you can get your mudding vehicle stuck in kind of Yeah, mud. it's like glue. Yes, it's a different kind of mud. It has a specific name. So just so happenstance, this year, perfect for 2023, because they like to 23 stamp all their weird Michael Jordan shit. So um, <laughs> I just think it's the Burning Man effigy, the first time that the Burning Man effigy didn't go off in time. But all these people are stuck in this thick mud with no necessities. They can't get out. They have all these camper trailers there. It's almost like they set up a Mad Max scenario that what are we all going to watch it like a fake Titan sub and wonder if they're going to get out OK? Like, it just seems like, oh, it's too and... bad the fire festival already took the name because this would be like a perfect example of it. This is my favorite, too, is uh, we keep hearing that there's Ebola being spread at the <laughs> the <laughs> the burning man, Ebola, Ebola. And now the newspapers have come out today. No, no, no. That's all conspiracy theory. But what they did is they put the word Ebola in our head. And last month. Um, I think the FDA approved Merck being able to give an Ebola vaccine to kids under 18. 
And if you look at the second biggest owner of Merck is BlackRock. And so I just <laughs> love that we're in BlackRock City and uh, the BlackRock company and they're going to talk about Ebola and then they're going to be spreading an Ebola vaccine. So, you know, but it's going to be root beer flavored. So it's not all bad. <laughs> yeah, it's so Or crazy. cotton candy. Like you get to pick either root beer or cotton candy flavor. <laughs> And it's like, I looked up like dynamics of Burning Man. It's like 80% white people and the average income of the guests is 50 grand a year, which I was like, okay, like for a concert, but the tickets are so expensive that they actually have um, income-based ticketing for something. Like you can get, <laughs> like, like you could take your WIC card down and get help to get to Burning Man. They have like an EBT system. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so crazy. So, um, yeah, what a crazy, it, it, it's just, uh, it's something that got bigger, even their symbology, how it's like the two curves coming in with the triangle. It looks like a candle, but it also look like they're like, look, it's a man spread out with its head, but it looks like a candle being burnt. So I, I also always think about that being such an obvious, like exoteric ritual. Oh, and they right? keep Cause... senses there. They want they, they keep, keep census, census of your religion, how many times you've burnt, if you're a virgin burner, that like they keep a full census log of everyone who goes and these details of them. Well, this, this is how the original, like the Bavarian Illuminati used to recruit people. They would find people that were into like really extreme, uh, esoteric y, uh, sort of like mysterious things that, that went beyond because there's something about people that would want to go and spend time and go to a burning man that they can be persuaded to do grand things, uh, either good or bad more so than someone that's just into mundane things all the time. But I wanted, I'm, I'm curious. Cause that's, that's like, let's get all of the people that are in this demographic. you right. It's if I want to go fishing, this is you like putting a little bit of a, uh, of, you know, like um, chum in the water to kind of attract them a little bit. But that's the exoteric because it's advertised and there's, you know, um, documentaries about it and articles and people are getting interviewed. But there has to be like an esoteric version of this, too. There has to be like the rich, um, profane, aren't allowed to see this version of that. And I, I this isn't a question because I don't think either of us have yeah. the answer. But I wonder is like, does that happen on property? Is there like an underground aspect? Is there like a burning man inside the burning man that has like an actual person in there? Uh, or like, is is this just the uh, the variation on like the Bohemian Grove and the Bohemian Grove is the real esoteric one? And this well, there's is the burning esoteric. man's all over the world that happen around the same time. There's like a huge one in South America. There's one called Castle Fest and they all are like the same kind of creepy. I didn't know that. Yeah, like I, because of this, it's like, you know how your files build up, build up, build up. And so now that like when you put Burning Man in your shit and you have stuff from like 2018 digs, 2019 digs, 2000, and you're like, oh my gosh. And then it like opens the stuff up back up in your head that you're like, even the Suicide Club, their whole gig to join the Suicide Club, tell me this isn't so skull and bones, is that you had to go through your affairs like the week of that you were you were going to kill yourself so you had to like go through all your affairs in your life say goodbye to everyone tell them like whatever you were going to tell them and then they took you somewhere like let's say to a high-rise building and they had you walking on a floor but they would convince you that if you step right you're dead if you step left you're dead and then they'd let you go and you just be like standing they'd be blowing a fan at you and be like okay jump 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 and those kind of things so once you jump like oh you're part of this thing now so it's like oh you're the suicide club like a san francisco chapter so it's like even these kind of things and then you go to a place like that where it's sound pushed unnatural lights pushed heat extreme heat very low resources where somebody just walks around and gives you a strawberry and you're excited about it constant music constant push all your like your senses the ones that are used to being quenched anytime you want are gone you're not allowed to do that and all your other senses that you're used to being able to turn off there's no quiet so it's like they're doing all those mk ultra techniques and then you take seventy thousand people and you push them out in society for a year like who knows what kind of rituals and things that are done or what kind of ideas you see people they get back from burning man and they're away 
Well, and you you mentioned how Skull and Bones is this. First of all, very right. That's the the tomb ritual where you go back and you recount um, everything you've ever done. But that itself is also heavily based on again Bavarian Illuminati ritual, where they would have a full inventory of like where where did you go? What kind of books do you have at your house? Um, like who do you lend your books to? What did you do last weekend? Just getting every little tidbit of your information about you because. At its heart, it is an intelligence network. It's just a secret. That's all what these secret societies are. Mm -hmm. But what's blowing my mind, because I've never heard about the suicide club that you brought up, that was one of the most controversial tenets of the original Bavarian Illuminati, which also got conferred to Skull and Bones. And that was this idea that suicide was not a sin, that it didn't get you kicked out, which, uh, I mean, I guess not a sin is, is the wrong way to put it, because if the true Bavarian Illuminati were pure atheists they were against the jesuits they were against the rosicrucians because the rosicrucians were still a little too spiritual and the bavarian illuminati were like you know those bumpkins those rubes um they we can never trust them with any real information because they're going to tattle to god at a certain point it was kind of like the premise there um but that was one of their their big pushes was the concept that suicide was an honorable way to go out and this kind of went hand in hand with like because if you ever get caught and are forced to give up the secrets, hey, like, here's this other option that's not so bad. And that same concept got, you know, pushed into Skull and Bones and that same exact thing that you're talking about, um, about like recounting all of your sins be because it's almost like you're about to die. That's it's almost a direct line between these two things. And it's such a unique aspect because they even had like a patron saint i don't, I don't have my notes in front of me then but the bavarian illuminati again. had a patron saint of suicide um that, that represented this very specific concept and i think it was again i don't know the name but it was like a story from the bible where like a guy ends up um killing himself because he doesn't want to get taken and um th there's been a few stories in the bible that kind of re relate to that same concept but this is a a crystal clear like you can point directly at it uh, doctrine that they had that got them condemned by the Pope at a certain point and for you to bring up the Suicide Club again and link it between the Skull and Bones there's definitely uh, a synchronicity here that I don't know man like because Burning Man it's both like mythical and like spiritual but it also feels very atheistic and like AI and futuristic because that's mm -hmm. also where lots of companies go and like here's the new solar stuff here's the new like th this new cool tech thing that you that's going to come out later and i almost see burning man as being like the bohemian grove lakeside talks where it's like hey here's this new thing that everyone's going to be talking about in six months but you're special because you're here so now you're going to get like the inside scoop on it and then just them giving them that inside scoop and getting them interested then th all those people go back home and start like spreading the secret that they weren't supposed to spread and it's almost like you're saying like with the counterculture grove everyone's aware that we're doing it they're aware we're all going to meet up they're like look at the, look at these 135 people that are meeting in this room we're gonna record them but <laughs> if we all go to burning man <laughs> your alex jones impression is awesome i love it <laughs> you just hear my this motherfucker is not real <laughs> um that people at burn now they can go to bohemian grove and like we were saying it's so much easier to do right in plain sight no one questions that jerry seinfeld and chris rock and alex jones and whoever else is going to this place or elon musk is there or elon musk's boat or planes in the middle of the desert or whatever these things no one questions it no one questions that a bunch of helicopters are flying in and we're assuming we see everything above the ground like this is such the Vegas and then look at the movie Fight Club and look at everything about Skull and Bones and suicide. Look at every way how, how they get them into the house like I am, you know, they don't even get their name until after they die. That's when they get their name back. I yeah, am Robert that, yeah. Paulson. I am Robert Paulson. So it's like they have to come in and they lose. They just become monkeys. Like the same way, slapped on the head, shaved, have to stand out front. You're not, you're worthless. You don't even deserve to be here. You're this, you're that, you're that. And yeah, because even like you're saying, the suicide is almost the opposite. So if your number one thing with joining my society is you have to be reverent. I have to know that about you. That's my number one rule is you have to be reverent. 
I don't care to who. I just have to know that you can be reverent. And once I suicide you right at the beginning of that and make you do that whole ritual, I've just proved you aren't reverent to who you think you are. You're reverent to me. But you are the reverence I'm looking for. You prove you can be brainwashed. I, I mean this in the nicest way possible. I think you would kill it if you ran a cult. <laughs> like, I think you would actually. I think would do okay. You would do okay. You would do okay. <laughs> I actually am, do you want to start a church because I think taxation is theft. And everyone I baptize at my church will become their own solo church. So they no longer will have to pay taxes. Is this where if I get pulled over, I'm like, I'm not driving, I'm traveling. <laughs> no, I don't even, it's just like, oh, you're part of our religion. I'll make a whole thing. Um, I'll, I have lawyers. I have all the stuff I have to do. I'm down, Very dude. If, can you squeeze some like mushrooms in there too? Like we can all take mushrooms legally. I'm, yeah, I'm all in. Yeah, I want in. a cruise boat just like, like, like Sea Org. Because we have <laughs> I mean to have maritime. It worked, and we, we would have to have, like, a Jordan Maxwell dedication somewhere, like a whole, like, maritime law uh, breakdown inside the boat oh, somewhere. Oh, yeah, totally. We'd have <laughs> conspiracy cruises and, like... You know what? <laughs> there was one of those for a little while. Oh, my God. This is this is, this is hilarious. This is random tangent. But there was a guy that, that put on the conspiracy con for many, many years. Well, he, he ended up planning a conspiracy cruise... But the people that he was helping plan it with swindled him out of all of his money. Like it actually turned into a conspiracy to like steal everything from this guy and bankrupt him. Um, but it's like like reading through it, it's oh, it's almost like a like oh I don't believe this. You know, like the the writers, you know, they they needed to go back into the writing room and make this more believable. But legit, the guy that that was in charge of the conspiracy conventions that reached to write in like San Francisco, I think, tried to do conspiracy cruise and went under because, you know, and it's, it's just like, I can just imagine him at the end of that, like, I'll never trust anyone again. But it's like, <laughs> you were already at the top of that. So like, I don't know. If you Poor had a conspiracy guy, cruise line, you would have to call it Titanic too. <laughs> Like you would just have to lean in or like, uh, what was the other Poseidon <laughs> Poseidon adventure? Oh, what was the tight? The, it was originally named after, uh, oh man, I'm, that's going to kill me. I think it was tight. There was a book called Titan, I think. Um, but it was, that was came before the Titanic actually the Titan. happened. Fu uh, futility. I think that was the name of the book. Anyways. Yeah. The I'll link it, I'll link it, it below. Yeah. And the I'll Titan was in it, and then yeah, then the whole sub thing, and then, uh, I that's why I, even that, I won't I won't get off on a tangent on the Titanic and the Titan and the sub and the blah. <laughs> like, it's dangerous whole... because we could just keep talking. Like we we constantly do. We just talk for like two or three I, hours on some I random know. topic. That's because it's just like everything's a rabbit hole. Even the Black Rock of it all. And then I saw one of the advertisers that's always at Black Rock is Polaris, the like little weird car company but then black rock is the rock that they say at the north pole below polaris Pol polaris <laughs> that is like the oh it's just a Negro. coincidence come <laughs> on just a coincidence <laughs> that's all the stuff that i'm like oh bernie man yeah the first one was june 21st 1986 is there but some numerology in that i'm not i don't i don't, I don't know do i'll have to here. i'll have to look that one up totally like that'll be a whole dig later on that i'll be like what is the june 21st thing i'll be on a cube map like j u n two one the q cipher <laughs> yeah. all right well let, let's wrap this up can i tell uh yeah tell people where they can find you i mean i can see it here projectchainy.com but where else where where do we go and find all the goods if you want to find all the goods, you can go to projectchaney.com. All my favorite shit posting, I like to do at Chaney underscore in underscore Wonderland on Instagram. I am so shadow banned there, so you have to type in the whole thing. And then I'm mm -hmm. in trouble like every other week. So it, it'll even say like, are you sure you want to follow this person? So Are you wait, sure? Wait, I mean, wait, she's wow. got an underline under her name and they circled it and they put a check <laughs> next to it and they're about they're to like, send her home. You don't she... want to get involved with this is making your social credit score go down <laughs> just for <laughs> looking over here but that's the site you want to follow and you can find me at project cheney um on twitter i've been trying to hang out there now on x 
uh, someone. Yeah, don't don't dead name Twitter or X. <laughs> I know X with their weird symbology, their SpaceX, their Sun X, Gen X, Madam X, Tom Hanks with an X. <laughs> oh man! Oh, don't you dare bring up Tom Hanks at the very end of this. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna get together and just do like a full Tom Hanks episode because. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it on the table there, but I want to 100%. <laughs> it is my, uh, on my list of things that I want to do for myself for like being back at it and getting more episodes out and sitting down. So if you're going to anywhere, oh, and I'm trying to get my YouTube up uh, to subscribers. So I know I only have three videos there right now. I will be getting out more, but one of the great ones is with you. So um Go over there. Well, that that one definitely won't interview. help you with your shadow ban, unfortunately. <laughs> well, my YouTube's fine. Like my YouTube channel, I'm goody goody now. over there. For <laughs> yeah, because you because you only got three <laughs> videos on there. It's why. I'm trying to be smart about like the how I put up the videos and the topics I talk about to do on YouTube. So, well, but I please, am going to upload if, all If you my do audio. Tom Hanks, please include me, only because I want to be devil's advocate on on whatever comes out of that. <laughs> okay, perfect. I I want to sit down and do uh. My fir I'm going to break down the entirety of Forrest Gump first. I feel like if I sit down and do Forrest Gump, all the other movies will be easy because Forrest Gump is just like a conversation with you where I'm like, I could do this all day. Like I could just keep pulling a thread and pulling a thread and pulling a thread and it just unravels. That's a deep one. Do we could have like a three hour um, 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 talk just on the happy face shirt segment of that movie, which is like a five minute, you know, segment. And it I, means so much. It's such I would a love huge... to do it in stills. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much. You'll be just for that. I would be like, okay, happy face me. I feel like even that alone <laughs> would be in so many parts because just when he opens his briefcase in the front, just the briefcase open and the Curious George book. Is it a Mandela effect? Are we going to talk about the author of Curious George and how he rewrote all the horoscopes in the sky and how he probably stole that book from somebody else? Are we going to talk about the red ping pong paddle that, oh, mom, is it OK if I collect this check from China? But everybody thinks I really play with this ping pong. Huh? We're doing Tom it. What, what if it's about <laughs> Forrest Gump being the first example of, hey, you can't trust your eyes anymore. Everything could be wag the dog. Here's a digital uh, recreation of Tom Hanks next to Elvis. Therefore, you can't believe anything ever again. The Bruder tapes re redone, like all the stuff. It was never real. And then uh, the Chinese infiltration of it all because he has his ping pong paddle and the, all of this. I think the best thing, though, about Forrest Gump is the thing now you can ask about whether it's Aleister Crowley or Tom Hanks or the Beatles. The lens that I had to have put into my head by just a random convo with Mark Steves Oh, Forrest Gump would have been the best super spy. If we call somebody a retard or if we make them so scary esoterically that everybody's scared to look, what a perfect person. If we call him a magician and he's going to do some stunt here, if we're saying we're having a burning man, it's all smoke and mirrors. <laughs> right. Oh, you can't take him seriously. He's not even, he's not right in the head or no, he he's thinks just a magic fast runner. is real. Yeah. He just ran right off. The <laughs> he just kept running and running. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let, let's do this one for sure. Um, Cheney, thank you so much for coming on. This was a long time coming. We'll have more of these and stay paranoid and buy this thing. Buy it. Buy they said it. it was forbidden. They said it was dangerous. They were right. Introducing the paranoid American homunculus owner's manual. Dive into the arcane, into the hidden corners of the occult. This isn't just a comic. It's a hidden tome of supernatural power. All original artwork illustrating the groundbreaking research of Juan Ayala, one of the only living homunculologists of our time. Learn how to summon your own homunculus, an enigma wrapped in the fabric of reality itself, their power at your fingertips, their existence, your secret. Explore the mysteries of the Aristotelian, the spiritual, the Paracelsian, the Crowleyan homunculus, ancient knowledge lost to time, now unearthed in this forbidden tale. This comic book holds truths not meant for the light of day, knowledge that was buried, feared, and shunned. Are you ready to uncover the hidden, the paranoid American homunculus owner's manual, not for the faint of heart? Available now from Paranoid American. Get your copy at tjojp.com or paranoidamerican.com today.